My only qualification for being here, um, apart from Richard Simpson's kindness, uh, is that I have for a long time been interested in Western efforts to know and understand ancient Greece, to maintain uh, or re-establish contact with Greek language and texts, uh, especially since the end of antiquity, though not only the Romans, but your problems understanding Greeks as well. Um, on the other hand, although I have looked at a couple of such efforts by Englishmen, um, and they're very impressive efforts uh, as well, they are a bit chronologically spaced out. Um, the Venerable Bede, uh, Robert Grosseteste in the 13th century, and a few people uh, around them. I know nothing about <coughs> English humanism, let alone Tudor politics. So it was certainly rash to try to make sense of the Greek studies of an English humanist, who was moreover mostly not an academic or even a scholar, uh, but heavily involved in Tudor politics. I do have some, uh, which seem to me quite convincing, uh, questions, uh, but I am still very short of any kind of answers, whether convincing or not. Um, <clears throat> uh, as you all know, Thomas Smith first went to Cambridge in 1524, a rather bright 11-year-old, and essentially remained there for the next 16 years, proceeding through matriculation, then BA, then MA, in the course of which he, like his near contemporaries, John Cheek and Roger Aspen, learned Greek well enough to be teaching it and formally paid to do it um, by his, um, uh, his college queens between 1535 and 1539. By the way, can you hear me? Alongside this, he had been studying some law, uh, enough to be offered a Regis chair in it. Admittedly, you know, he didn't at that point yet have a degree in law. Uh, it was like that, I suppose. Uh, so in May of 1540, he set off to study in France and Italy and returned in January of 1542 to qualify, um, get a degree in law and take up his post. The one work of his that demonstrates his Greek studies, um, you have, uh, I'm just um, remembering it, I've got it here, I don't need to turn around. Um, <laughs> uh, um, a picture of, its, um, of the title page as it was published on the correct and reformed pronunciation of the Greek language, which at 96 pages is also the most substantial um, work he published in his lifetime. And this is signed off at the end, because it purports to be a letter. That's quite a strange letter in three books. Um, I don't know if there are patristic examples of that, but don't normally have, letters don't normally have books within them. Um, uh, at the end, it's signed off, Cambridge, 12th of August, 1542. Though, as you see from the picture, it wasn't published till 26 years later, in 1568. What had prompted him to write was to support his friend John Cheek, who, on taking up his Regis chair in Greek, had publicly espoused ancient Greek pronunciation, not as practiced by the modern Greeks, who had served as the main teachers of Greek to the generations of Westerners who had been eager to learn since 1398, but as what is called the Erasmian pronunciation, that is, as it could be reconstructed on the basis of classical sources, both Greek and Latin. Erasmus's tract on the subject was published in 1528, combined with his notorious Cicaronianus, both delightfully witty and highly polemic dialogues designed to get up the noses of a fair range of people and, of course, succeeding Erasmus. Cheek claimed that he and various friends had been interested in the uh, ancient pronunciation before knowing of Erasmus's work, and that may well be. As Ingram Bywater and others have shown, plenty of scholars had drawn attention in print to the discrepancy between classical and modern pronunciation of Greek from at least 1481 onwards. Um, Bywater's dates, incidentally, are all far too late, and he couldn't know uh, in. Imagine a way to it, of course. Um, uh, 
uh, how much earlier printings there are of a lot of the things that he discussed. So, from the 1480s onwards, you have things in print that point out the difference between modern and Byzantine Greek. Richard Croke, for instance, who went on to teach Greek in Cambridge, had made the point, briefly but with some vigour, in his Greek primer, which he published in Leipzig in 1516. In any case, Cheek had been teaching with this reformed pronunciation, as had also Smith and Ascham, since at least 1535. But in 1542, there was a sudden backlash. Most subsequent accounts of this period, uh, of this episode, uh, beginning with John Scribe, though actually for some moderns are, are much worse, uh, go roughly like this. The excellent, forward-looking, young, uh, and Protestant humanists working for the progress uh, of letters had introduced the new and more correct and enlightened pronunciation of Greek. The die-hard conservative, basically still scholastic bishop, uh, I mean, he, he cites Aristotle, uh, can, can be more scholastic than that. Uh, no wonder he went on to burn Protestants for uh, uh, the Queen Mary. Uh, that bishop and chancellor of the university issued a rabid edict quashing the humanists and their new pronunciation. Only temporarily, however, as truth will out in the end, and soon everyone, we are told, was using the reformed pronunciation that had been pioneered by Cheek and Smith. Uh, and the, the controversy about pronunciation um, is rather widely um, taken to be a kind of turning point in um, uh, humanism and particularly the creation of uh, groups of humanists. I think it is worth looking at the controversy a bit differently. The last point, for a start, uh, reformed pronunciation <coughs> sweeping over uh, <coughs> Europe, um, is very far from the truth. Although, as I mentioned, awareness of the differences between ancient and Byzantine pronunciation of Greek had long been widespread, that didn't mean that it was everywhere adopted. The Greek grammars written by Greeks um, uh, Chrysolorus, um, Constantine Lascaris, Theodor Gaza, naturally didn't say anything about pronunciation. Um, they're writing a Greek grammar as Greeks, so you don't begin by saying how you pronounce your own language. Uh, and even some Western ones, like Keporinus's compendium, uh, it doesn't say anything. Uh, it's one of the uh, grammars of Greek that were popular in Cambridge. Uh, when those were used, the pronunciation would probably depend on the teacher. But many Greek grammars written by Westerners that did talk about pronunciation still preserved the Byzantine one, and sometimes quite polemically. Um, right, goes on? Yes. Um, this is the alphabet page. Um, of one that was also popular in Cambridge by Nicholas Clenardus. Uh, it was first published in 1530, but what you've got here is a uh, Lyon printing of 1581, and they continue beyond on to, to the end of the 16th century. Uh, and you see, uh, you have um, Alpha Vita, and you pronounce it with a U or V. Uh, you have uh, uh, eat what we call eater, but pronounced A, is here given, uh, we pronounce it I. The last column is how you're supposed to pronounce the letters. Um, uh, Omicron is O Pagum, and Omega is O Magnum, um, with no indication that what we're talking about is quantities there. And in fact, if you see um, Greek students, I mean, uh, students of Greek, their notes, um, uh, on margins of texts, the uh, confusion between epsilon and eta, long and short e and long and short o, is everywhere. Um, they really found it quite hard to distinguish, uh, distinguish those. And you see that at the bottom of the alphabet, there we have some scholia, 
some uh, notes, um, uh, which follow on onto the next page. And they declare that this table shows how the letters should be pronounced, adding that there are multiple gram grammarians' opinions on this subject, because some people who are curios uh, some people curiose nimis, pedantically, want to return to the ancient way, while they themselves aren't sure what that might be, and their conjectures are ad modum yeuni, pretty threadbare. So you shouldn't trust them, says the scholiast, who is antisignalist. Um, you shouldn't trust them, at least until they manage to raise an ancient Greek up from the dead. <laughs> uh, more interesting, in a way, I think, is Gardiner's role in the controversy, as uh, found in the Fab Kungu. Let's look at this, at his savage edict that sparked off the controversy, issued on June the 1st, 1542. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm not worried too much if you can't read. Can you read it? Um, I've helpfully underlined a few things. Um, uh, here is what I, Stephen, uh, Bishop, etc., decree is to be respected, followed, maintained in the matter of pronunciation of Greek and Latin. Uh, spectandum, sequendum, tenendum, sit. These sort of um, uh, <coughs> semi synonyms in, without connectives are typical of the legal style. Um, <coughs> uh, in the second paragraph, uh, anyone who recognises my uh, authority, let no such person dare dream up sounds for Latin and Greek letters different from those in current use. Let no one dare. Ne audeto. Uh, now, that's not any ordinary imperative. It's the so-called future imperative. It was archaic, used in, you find those in Doctors and Terence and so on. Um, and actually, this particular one only occurs once in classical Latin, uh, but the context is revealing uh, because it occurs in the uh, made-up archetypal law code that Cicero introduces in his De Legibus. Right? Um, let's invent laws and ideal laws which are presented then in the language, something like the Twelve Tables or archaic uh, Latin. Um, and those laws are full of these uh, <coughs> um, archaic imperatives, uh, including ne audeto. Um, there's lots, as you can see. Um, if you go on the next paragraph, whatever greater authority decrees, orders, determines, uh, all shall embrace and observe. Amplectuntor et observantor. Now, I've so far actually failed to find the text of any other Chancellor's decree from that period, but I find it very hard to believe that this was the normal language form, no matter how solemn the issue, because it's highly, uh, people knew their sister, and they knew uh, that this was uh, a style that belonged. Um, with the Twelve Tables, with ancient uh, <coughs> uh, legal speak. Moreover, um, as the edict proceeds, the character goes fairly over the top. You see the little arrow um, on the right-hand side of the page. Um, as regards the letter B, thou shalt not thicken it in the, matter of, in the manner of our B, but utter it, utter it more softly like the. <coughs> On the next page, again, um, <coughs> we suddenly get, uh, <coughs> again you have an arrow, ne multa. Uh, now that's, that's absolutely not legal language. Um, <coughs> lawyers never say uh, to cut a long story short. However, ne multa, in the matter of sounds, ne philosophato. You will not philosophize. Uh, thou shalt not philosophize, but use only those that are current. 
He then lays down stiff penalties for each category of person that knowingly and deliberately defies this edict. And finally, at the end, um, <coughs> sorry, on the gang, um, uh, uh, in summa, all shall hold this edict as sacrosanct, so that it will be considered neither lax to the contumacious nor hard on those who come to their senses. We've had all sorts of details about pronunciations of letters and diphthongs, and this is uh, to be held sacrosanct. Um, and uh, <coughs> recipiscentibus, those who come to their senses, of course recalls rather um, what you hope will uh, occur to heretics. The text of this decree survives only in the publication of the huge exchange of letters between Cheek and Gardiner, which happened only 13 years later, in 1555, when Cheek was in exile in Basel, it was published in Basel. That publication raises a number of questions, but let's rather turn to our earliest evidence for the controversy, a letter that Roger Asman wrote to a friend, Bransbury, Bransby, in about 1542, updating him on the Cambridge scene. Thanks to the munificence of Henry VIII, he says, there has been a transformation. The Greek classics uh, are now being more, or at least as much, read as any classics used to be, uh, any Latin classics used to be. The ardour for letters has been set alight by the hard work and example of our friend Cheek. He lectured publicly and for free on the whole of Homer, Sophocles twice, all Euripides, nearly all Herodotus, and would have gone on to do the same for all Greek poets, historians and uh, orators and philosophers, if an abominable blow of fate had not begrudged us this fruitful burgeoning of letters. For since Cheek had added to his diligence an excellent fortification for learning Greek, namely the true and ancient pronunciation of it, lo and behold, the very reverend Bishop of Winchester, persuaded by the demands of some envious types, issued a pretty severe edict against use of that pronunciation, thereby not only removing a great help for Greek studies against the wishes of the entire university, but thoroughly dampening practically all enthusiasm for learning Greek. Um, he then uh, inveighs uh, against um, the Byzantine pronunciation. Uh, it makes Greek sound like nothing but twittering of sparrows, hasum pipitationem, and hissing of snakes. But what makes this even harder to bear, he goes on, is that the person who has caused this virtual destruction of Greece, of Greek, is one who is excellent in all the foundations of letters, wisdom, counsel, and authority, and who, but for this one thing, would be the most generous patron of letters and of our university. So much for the scholastic. On this topic, uh, he, uh, Ascom says, there are letters the size of books exchanged between the bishop and Cheek. No one can defend a barbarous pronunciation imported by barbarians more learnedly than does our bishop. <coughs> but he may have the power, and we have the better cause. You could hardly believe the grandeur of Cheek and his marshalling of texts, arguments, and authorities for this cause, unless you yourself read the letters he has written for it. Um, now, this tells us, I think, quite a few things. Um, in the year, more or less, of the controversy itself. First, it's clear that the compliments that both Cheek and Smith make to Gardner as regards his humanistic culture are not merely flattering nor ingratiating. Ascom is not writing to Gardner, and plainly he believes that the decree was out of character. Indeed, Gardner's own writing is more than enough evidence that he was no scholastic. He engages in the polemic with gusto and sh showing masterly command of the appropriate Latin style. He purports to find Cheek's behaviour arrogant and unbridled, and no doubt to some extent he thought so too. But neither Cheek's nor indeed Smith's career seems to have suffered in any way from this flamboyant polemic, which, as Ascom le Ascom's letter also shows, the polemic text was circulating in manuscript, at least in part. But it is striking that in Ascom's account here there is no mention of Smith uh, in this context. Possibly Ascom was writing before August 
of 1542, when Smith penned his own defence? Or possibly Smith preferred not to be too public in his intervention at the time? I don't know. However, another letter of Ascombe from considerably later, 1550, does pair uh, Cheek and Smith, and in a way that also, I think, um, gives us a clue to reading their tracts on pronunciation. Um, uh, you can see about uh, uh, five lines down. In how studenti we am plurimi Johannes Kirby et Thomas Smithy exemplis. Um, uh, many people um, <coughs> have been uh, have uh, started out on this path of study, um, roused by the examples, the precepts, uh, the minds, the counsel uh, of John Cheek and Thomas Smith. Means in uh, humanistic studies. These two stars, once of our university and now of the whole state, by 1550, uh, both Smith and Cheek are um, uh, at court, uh, are now uh, shining even in the splendour of, uh, of the court. And had they uh, devoted themselves to writing, then England would have uh, <coughs> gloried um, with as much justice in these two as Italy does with Sagoletto or France with Longueuil. And this is clear enough to us, um, if only from that little book uh, on the correct uh, writing of uh, pronunciation of Greek. Um, that's the pronunciation that we use in Cambridge, um, which he had written. There's a bit of puzzle here, because why is that verb conscripts at the end in the singular? Which of them had written? Is he thinking of cheek? It's slightly odd that this isn't having stressed that England has two, where Italy and France each have one. Um, <laughs> it seems odd um, to refer to only the one. The title that he gives uh, isn't exactly the title of either Smith or um, uh, cheek. Um, but why Sagoletto and Longueuil? Well, of course, because they are preeminent Ciceronians. Uh, and um, one way, uh, in one way, the controversy is perhaps as much about uh, <coughs> Latin as about Greek. It's about uh, <coughs> people capable of writing um, in uh, <coughs> Uh, a Ciceronian style to match the best uh, in Europe. Uh, and in some ways you could say, well, the, the issue of pronunciation of Greek uh, is secondary to that. Uh, at any rate, that is how Ascom is presenting it here. But back to Smith. Uh, as I said, he didn't publish uh, his work at the time. Um, uh, he also didn't publish, uh, ever, um, Gardiner's reply to his tract. Um, in the British Library, there is a manuscript which um, is in part said to be autographed, um, and uh, that also is the only one that has the text of Gardiner's reply. Um, <coughs> uh, sorry, I can cut here. I think. Um, uh, but apart from why not published at the time, perhaps you might say, well, uh, it's one thing for things to circulate in manuscript between friends, it's quite another to splash out in print when you're in polemic uh, with a rather important uh, bishop and chancellor. Um, what he... Um, uh, <coughs> But um, 26 years between writing and publication is a long time, and uh, one might also ask, well, why did he publish it then? Um, at any rate, what he published was at least in part revised, uh, because at a certain point in his treatise, you suddenly come across a great chunk of Greek. There's bits of Greek recited all the way through, of course, but here, you see, you've got quite a, a big chunk of it, 
which he then translates not quite completely. Um, and what it is, is a passage from Genesis of Halicarnassus, one of his works on style. Um, it is actually a crucial text in the debate because Genesis, almost like a modern linguist, tells you exactly how uh, each of the vowels uh, were pronounced. In other words, what you do with your tongue, your lips, and so on, to form each of the vowels, um, as you have them in the list in the left-hand margin. Uh, so, an important text um, in this debate, um, but it was only published in 1547, so a full five years after the controversy uh, and the supposed date, uh, 1542, of Smith's, um, <coughs> uh, Smith's um, tract. Um, <coughs> it's not only the one chunk, um, a bit further on, you have a further uh, chunk of that kind from the same work, um, commenting on uh, the differences between long and short vowels. Um, and <coughs> here, uh, we have no translation. Smith is just um, publishes uh, the just uh, uh, includes the Greek text, uh, and then proceeds to say, "Non put on I don't think that anybody who is not thick or who doesn't bring to this debate uh, a mind of lead uh, or um, a spirit of uh, obstinacy and um, shamelessness." these two being uh, the, most the worst impediments of studies. No one uh, who comes to this without those impediments uh, could um, depart without clearly seeing uh, what Dionysius is here telling us to do. Um, and as for the difference between, um, oops, um, I fear that this actually, uh, this slide is not quite enough, but, um, uh, the um, difference between long and short vowels um, is uh, very clear. Now, um, in Gardiner's reply, um, he had, uh, and also in his, um, in his uh, discussion with Cheek, um, Gardiner had said there's no evidence for this difference uh, between the long and the short vowels. How can you possibly maintain how can you even imagine what that difference might be? Um, and this is what uh, Smith is saying, you've got to be really thick if you read Dionysius and um, don't see that, although this cannot have been in the original uh, draft. Um, but he then goes on to uh, apply that, to show it from English. And I'm very sorry about this slide because what you have at the bottom of the page there is that uh, he tells you, um, <coughs> uh, you see, cum amlike, um, that you have a, a long A and a short A. Well, that is, as for instance, a short A in man and a long A in main, uh, as we would say in any case. Uh, and he gives lots of English examples um, of that. Um, That um, comment after his Greek quotation is pretty, uh, is pretty um, uh, sharp, and perhaps uh, you might not uh, publish it, you might not indeed write it to your bishop. But of course, by 1568, uh, both Cheek uh, and Gardiner were long since dead. Um, on the other hand, the issue was still alive. Um, and uh, also, the tract does raise a whole lot of other issues, um, which perhaps uh, Smith felt were still relevant in 1568, or might be helpful to publish. Not least, perhaps, the combination with uh, the issue of English spelling. Ancient Greek is dead, it's one of his strong points, not that widely made, therefore it is static. Therefore, you, it shouldn't change uh, in its pronunciation. English, on the other hand, is alive, and we should change its spelling 
because uh, it would be easier to represent sounds as they are. Um, we shouldn't, I think, too much assume uh, that um, the um, uh, opposition to him were obscurantist. I do wonder a bit how we would react if some bright young sparks decided that Shakespeare should be performed in the original Tudor pronunciation, uh, for instance. Um, but uh, a central issue for Smith, and which uh, <coughs> um, the tract on Greek uh, almost um, wraps up or, or covers up, is the issue of the freedom of scholarship uh, against authority or um, uh, arbitrary decrees. And uh, perhaps that issue uh, is permanent value. called Early Studies at Cambridge, Antiquity and New Studies, is Richard Simpson, and he's going to speak to us on studying Roman law, reading about building. Richard. Thank you very much, Jill. Thank you very much, indeed, Carlotta. Uh, what I plan to do in this talk is to show how Sir Thomas Smith studied the text of the Roman law while he was at Cambridge in the early 1540s, introduced him to understandings of Roman building, which we can then see in forming his later reading of Vitruvius, and indeed his building at Hill Hall. <coughs> I also hope to show that while the evidence which Smith offers us is exceptional, exceptional in its detail as well as its range. It gives us insights into ways of thinking about building, which were both fundamental and widely shared in the mid 16th century. As we just heard from Carlotta, thank you very much indeed again, Thomas Smith had been actively engaged in the developing study of Greek at Cambridge and lectured on Greek in his own college, Queen's, from 1535 to 1538. But he claimed later that he had started to study Roman law in about 1533, when he bought copies of the legal text from the local bookseller. And in January 1539, when he was 26 years old, Queen's gave him exceptional leave to travel abroad to study any of the three advanced disciplines, that is, theology, medicine, or Roman law. This permission was granted on condition that by 1543 it become either Doctor of Medicine or of Roman Law or Bachelor of Divinity. After 18 months or so in France and Italy, when Smith returned to Cambridge in early 1542, and as Connaught quite rightly said, without having taken a degree uh, anywhere other than in Cambridge, um, it was to take up the, the new post established by King Henry VIII of Regis Professor of Civil or Roman Law. The new Regis Professorships at Oxford and Cambridge in Theology, Medicine, Greek and Latin, as well as Roman Law, were founded as part of the settlement of dissolved church property, and so could be seen as part of the larger process of the Protestant Reformation. Long-standing complaints about canon law and plans for its replacement suggested a potential enhancement of the role of Roman law in England. If Roman law was an academic study, it was also seen as part of a larger reform with practical application in everyday life. And Smith's study of Roman law was the foundation of his career as he moved from university office to government service. In 1544 to 45, he was the presiding judge of the court of the Bishop of Ely, the Diocese of Ely, itself a Reformation foundation. From 1547, he was a Master of Requests, a judge of the Court of Requests established by the Duke of Somerset, Lord Protector and proponent of continuing Protestant reform. Also in 1547, Smith was made a member of the Royal Commission 
chaired by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, to determine the legality of the divorce and second marriage of William Parr, Marquess of Northampton and brother to Henry VIII's widow, <coughs> uncle to the king. In 1551, Smith was appointed a member of the Royal Commission set up to reform ecclesiastical law. More generally, as ambassador uh, for Edward VI and Elizabeth, the Roman law supplied the common language of international relations. But for Smith, even the text which he was to teach as the first known reader's professor of Roman law at Cambridge could themselves be seen as the product of an act of reform. The great tidying up undertaken on behalf of the Emperor Justinian in the middle of the 6th century. Assembled by a group of lawyers who sifted through the accumulated legal records of Rome, these texts, judgments or opinions of lawyers on points of legal dispute, had been edited and organised into the 50 books of the Digest, given an introductory overview called the Institutes, and completed by a collection of the constitutions of the emperors called the Code. And for Smith, the law texts themselves were part of a wider process of scholarly reform. In 1542, when Smith wrote the letter which Carlotta has been analysing for us, in support of the campaign on Greek pronunciation, he explicitly located himself and his fellow linguistic reformers in a tradition of scholarship which began with Lorenzo Alla, was followed by Adriano Castellesi, Thomas Lineker, and Guillaume Boudet who, he said, cleaned up that thoroughly and restored its true splendour. Later in the same letter, Smith cited Boudet and Andrea, Andrea Giardo as the leading Roman law scholars in France and Italy, great men worthy of honour, and as exemplary models in the emendation of texts, that necessary correction of the errors which had accumulated in the copies of man copying of manuscripts over the centuries as well as the states of interpretation. And because Smith's five volumes of the text of the Roman law survived, this is the title page of the first volume, we can see that his copies were of an edition brought up to date by means of the scholarship he so admired. Smith's copies were part of his bequest of books to his college, the bequest still preserved in the old library of Queens. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the librarians of Queens over many years for all their help in studying Smith's books. And it's great that at least one of the librarians of Queens is with us today, and I think probably two. Thank you so much. Printed in Lyon between 1538 and 1540 in a large folio format, Smith's volumes have the text. Um, by that read, nuclear mark. <laughs> uh, and the traditional commentary, with an addition, notes printed in the margins, giving references to the work of both Fidel and Acciato. And to these, Smith added his own manuscript interventions. We're, we're going to come back to these if we were to it later on throughout the volumes. And these annotations may well be the notes which Smith referred to in his inaugural lectures as Regis Professor when he cited them as evidence for his own thorough reading of the law. If so, his notes can be dated to between 1540 and 1542. Not studied before, Smith's notes show the sort of extensive reading undertaken by a contemporary advanced student of law, but they also indicate how particular topics could emerge as distinctive. Smith's manuscript interventions take three forms. The underlining of printed text, the addition of notes in the margins, and the drawing, also in the margins, of thumbnail sketches. Some of these sketches are of essentially similar images, a little like a computer icon, which suggests that they may have provided a function in categorizing the material, a long-recognized problem in this vast text. They may, too, have served a mnemonic function, one icon of a woman's head seems to be associated with passages relating to marriage. Smith drew another of a simple building beside passages relating to buildings. There are some 25 <coughs> building icons throughout the text. 
So while Smith selectively annotated the whole of his copy of the Digest of the Code, the icon suggests that he recognised some passages as forming a distinct topic. It is these passages on building which I want us to look at today. They offer us the only known evidence, for, the earliest known evidence for Smith's engagement with texts on Roman building, and in particular on the Roman house. It's scarcely surprising that the building was an important issue in the Diocese. Much of the law represented by the jurist's opinions related to the rights and obligations associated with property ownership. Arguments and court cases might arise from the right of one person to benefit from the use of another's building, or from the rights of an adjoining owner to light, or to drainage, or to structural support. The rights of neighbours to be protected from the failure of building set out. More generally, the Roman jurists addressed buildings through their users as well as owners and their agents, and considered buildings in terms of contracts, of rights to sell to let, and in particular, the laws of inheritance. And these passages relate to building in a very particular way. A jurist's opinion might express the legal principle on which a judgment was grounded, while also providing the detailed circumstances, the facts, of each case. While the legal principles might have a broad conceptual basis and wide application, the facts might be very specific as well as very practical, addressing details of site, materials and function, as well as building components and spaces. Three topics in particular emerge from the passages uh, marked with the little building, um, and they are component elements of the Roman house, the decoration of the Roman house, and issues relating more broadly to building structure. A number of passages noted by Smith identify the spaces and services a Roman house might contain. So in a legal opinion on what the beneficial user, rather than the owner, of a house might alter, Smith noted a description which distinguished both back and front doorways as well as a series of interior spaces, an atrium, reception rooms, and private spaces. There were also gardens or green spaces, and all were considered to be elements determining the character of the house and so not to be altered. An opinion on possible damage from damp through a party wall led Smith to list those parts of a house which might cause problems for a neighbour, whether there was a legal remedy or not. He noted a system of storing water to Stellum, at both a bath, balneum, and a warm room, tepidarium, and a vaulting room, camera. He also noted associated services, the ducts of a hippocorps, the water pipes, which were not allowed against a party wall because of the damage they might cause to an adjoining owner through either damp or fire. Some spaces, spaces mentioned in the law, like a sunroom, or an element such as a side dial, were not only identified as parts of a house, they were also considered in terms of their functional requirements. Sunlight must not be obstructed in the case of a sunroom, for example. While these passages essentially provided simple identifications of the spaces and services to be found in a Roman house, supplemented by indications of their functions, these lists were filled out by extensive details of the decoration and the contents of the domestic spaces. And these aspects were the subject of Smith's repeated attention. The law was concerned with what was considered to be legally part of a building, those things which shouldn't be removed when the house was either sold or bequeathed. Smith wrote out in his own marginal summary details of a ruling by the Senate that spelt out those attached images, signa and fixa, including statues and pictures which could not legally be removed. A parallel point was made, and again noted by Smith, in discussion of what things were to be kept with a house as part of the necessary equipment for its operation. In these legal opinions, Smith noted passages referring to decorative marble, painted walls and frescoes, paintings hung on the wall but not fixed to the building, decorative plasterwork, and statues, both freestanding and fixed to pedestals. The legal image of the Roman house noted by Smith included built-in bookcases and bas basins for fountains, 
as well as furnishings from tables, ivory, glass, gold and silver, to hugs, rugs and hangings. These texts and notes point to a developing word picture of the house as lived in space, which clearly points to the importance of decorative finishes and fittings of the Roman house and emphasised their recognised legal status. One of the key tests determining the legal status of these important decorative elements in the building was the nature of their fixing to the structure itself, a test which might involve consideration of the constructive nature of the building, which was also an issue of critical importance in a wide range of legal cases concerned with structural adequacy. One section of Book 39 of the Digest addressed building failure. Smith's notes here include building icon put in the form of a collapsed building. <laughs> Smith noted legal opinions on the causes of building failure, including inadequate specification, as well as the recognition of that, uh, recognition that derelict buildings were a matter of concern to public authorities, an issue of good governance. Much of the legal concern with structure and construction was expressed through the extensive case law on party walls. Here Smith noted a series of passages which demonstrated the recognition that enforcing one of the key part of all rights, the right of support, required an understanding of building structure. For example, where a part of all was inadequate and needed to be demolished and replaced, the jurist explained that the question of whether or not the wall was fit to support the way you put on it must be investigated. It was also set out that structures, that a structure might, instead of a wall, be a column, which can considered in similar functional terms to a low bearing wall. And the means of fulfilling the obligations were discussed, setting out, for example, that a replacement structure might be specified as either another structure of the same type, or more specifically, in square or other building stone. In this last example, Smith wrote out the phrase lapide quadrato, lapide structile, in a marginal note. And at this point in Smith's copy, printed notes in the margins of the text added further comment on that day quadrato in square stone. One note adding a reference to Gilbert Day's discussion of the bill of building stone in his notes of the digest. First printed in 1508, this massive study of the Roman law text had established Day as a scholar compared by contemporaries with Erasmus. We have seen that Smith identified Boudet as the preeminent contemporary local scholar, one of the great men worthy of all honour, whom he sought to emulate. Later this morning, we will hear about Smith's use of Boudet, Boudet's work on Roman coinage from Deborah and Andrew. Smith listed a copy of Boudet's notes on the digest in his library, and the commentary to which the printed note in Smith's digest volume refers shows how Boudet himself addressed one of the technical building issues identified by Smith in his marginal notes. Boudet's discussion of squared stone is part of his commentary on the ruling by the Roman jurist Ulpio on a party wall dispute over a neighbour's right to structural support for a gallery whose roof was supported on columns built on top of a party wall. It was the meaning of the words used by Ulpio for these columns, columnae structiles, which Boudet sought to understand. He began by explaining that columnae structiles were those columns which are constructed either of square stone or bricks, which we call piers, pili. Emphasizing that piers were composite constructions of stone or brick and cement, while columns properly had a shaft made of one single block of stone, Boudet drew into his exploration Greek terms used by Pliny the Elder in his natural history, and by the Greek orators of Socrates and Demosthenes, as well as Latin terms used by the poets Persis and Horace. The names and parts of the columns, the shaft, capital base, and stylet, today turn to Vitruvius Book 3. But with the terms associated with the column, today has only just got started. When he turned to the second term, Structiles, he explored the legal text through a series of direct quotations from Vitruvius. He drew on Vitruvius' description of underground masonry sewers, masonry cunnings for water supply, 
and masonry vaults and public baths. He quoted the truths on the masonry structures which made it possible for the tenement blocks in ancient Rome to be built several stories high. He added the truths account of the types of masonry construction which included squared stone and concrete, pointing to the value of the walls in coarse and molded masonry. Boudet finally considered the building processes involved in the use of dressed stone, drawing on Pliny's comment on the need to keep the masonry true with square level and plumb line, which Boudet supplemented by a quotation from Vitruvius on the use of these implements in plaster work. Boudet concluded from this analysis that Ulpin's opinion had included load bearing masonry columns or piers constructed <coughs> in either squared stone or concrete. While Ulpian's legal opinion cited, at least as examples, the types of structure which the neighbor had been granted the right to erect, today's analysis explored the nature of the construction of these structures in much greater detail. And while remaining focused on the meaning of specific technical terms in Ulpian's legal opinion, Budeva's use of attributes in this commentary also gave emphasis to the ten books on architecture as a text about construction. More broadly, through his commentary on this phrase from the Roman law, and by drawing together seven passages from Vitruvius scattered through four of the ten books, today provided a compendium of Vitruvius' statements on the nature of the construction of the column, conveniently reformulating Vitruvius. At the same time, by bringing together relevant references on these terms from other ancient authors, ranging as we've seen from Socrates and Horace to Pliny the Elder, he also provided commentary on the ten books on architecture. Today's discussion of columnae structiles is only one of some 30 commentaries on building in Pudet's notes in that digest, in which he drew on the truths. In his legal commentary, Pudet showed how the work of Vitruvius, which he explicitly recognised as difficult, obscure, and textually corrupt, could become coherent and legible while technical topics were seen as valid subjects for scholarly investigation. So if Budet showed how the text of the Roman law which Smith was later to note could inform contemporary scholars about Roman building, he also offered a bridge to the reading of Vitruvius. And Budet's reading certainly informed the developing scholarly study of Vitruvius. His commentary on the Roman law was referenced by later translators like Jean Martin and by commentators like Daniel Ivaro and Guillaume Philandrier. And when we come to Smith's later annotations to Petruvius' text and to Philandrier's commentary to be found in Smith's copy of the 1550 edition, I suggest that we can see reflections of his earlier readings in the legal text and especially their emphasis, parallel with Boudet, on the column of the structure. And in his, in his discussion of the detailed planning of temples in Book 3, Chapter 2, Petruvius identified seven primary design forms, principia. Each was broadly speaking defined by the relationship of the columns to the wall structure, enclosing the temple sanctuary. Smith only noted the first of these principles, that in antis, underlining both Greek and Latin terms. I'm afraid you probably can't make out the higher point on the left. Um, uh, but also adding a manuscript note in Antis in the margin beside the last part of the printed text. When Philandrier commented on this passage, he explained that I interpret anti in this passage of stone piers, pili, at the extreme ends of the wall. Smith underlined the whole of Philandrier's comment and added in the margin of the printed commentary his own interpretation, identifying anti and pili as buttresses. While Vitruvius' text here clearly addressed anti as design forms, conceptual fundamentals, and given that Smith and Philandrier were clear that anti had formed the gauge columns, Smith's use of the term buttress suggests a different concern to the functional anti as structure. And this interpretation is reinforced when Smith repeated his identification 
equating both the term to Antire and Palestine, that's square pilaster, to buttresses in his extensive marginal summary of Vitruvius' discussion of the terms used for structural timbers in Book 4, Chapter 2. In this passage, Vitruvius identified by name the timber elements, beams, joists, and rafters, for example, and you can Smith, see Smith listing them down on, on the right hand side of the, of the page, and then writing that again at the foot of the page, and adding at the side, at the left hand side, that Palastata and Antar are buttresses. So, in referring to Columnae, Palastata, and Antar here, Petruvius' own emphasis is on their structural world. Smith's two sets of notes suggest that he developed his understanding of Antai by paralleling the two passages in Books 3 and 4, but giving weight not to the design forms of Book 3, but the structural focus of Book 4, which had the support of the familiar emphasis gathered from his readings in the legal text. Can we go further? Can we move from these readings in the legal text and in the trivia? what Smith built at Hill Hall in the late 1560s and the mid-1570s. It's hard not to see Smith's <coughs> the law as giving him a sense of the interior character of the Roman house, which was reflected in his remarkable ambitions for the decorative work at Hill Hall. Not only the signet and fixer in the figurative wall paintings, tile and glass paintings, but the trompe l'oeil work to the ceiling beam and the marble lined walls, even if they were realised in paint. And would the reading of Vitruvius, informed by the emphasis of the legal text, help explain another exceptional feature of the last stage of Smith's building at Hill Hall? In Book 6, Chapter 8, Vitruvius addressed a number of structural questions relevant to the private house, making it clear in these passages that Pili the structures in the manner of Antai were features of private buildings as well as of temples. Having discussed the way Antai or Pili could be used to provide a structural framework to the elevations, Petruvius himself suggests that Pili might have a valuable buttressing function. To ensure structural stability, piers or engaged columns at extreme ends or angles of buildings should be of greater scale than the other piers. In Jean Martin's French translation, 1857, which Smith had in his library, both column height as well as width were emphasised, and a more general structural application suggested. Is it possible that Smith's giant order at Hill Hall reflects a reading of this explanation of a method by which the Romans achieved structural stability in domestic building? The location of the giant engaged columns close to the corners of the tower on the south elevation of Hill Hall, here in Paul Drury's impressive reconstruction, would seem to fit this suggestion. On the east elevation, two of the five columns discovered would appear to be consistent with corner locations. Three may suggest a more formal purpose of achieving a degree of symmetry. Oops. Just go. Sorry about that. If Smith's giant order can be identified with a structural understanding, then use might then be seen as part of the developing sophistication in the masonry construction which Paul Drury has identified in this last phase of Smith's building material. In this case, what strikes us as an essentially decorative element on the exterior may be better recognised as a statement of understanding of sound broken construction. I've tried to show that while Smith's study of Roman law in the early 1540s was the basis of his career, it also introduced him not just to Roman building and to the Roman house, but to Roman building as a matter of construction and sound structure. Guillaume Day's own study of the law showed how much could be learned of Roman building from the digest, how technical matters were valid topics for scholarly engagement and what Petruvius could contribute when read in this context as a text on construction. Thank you. I'd like to kick off by uh, asking Carlotta, it was quite interesting, Gardner saying it's about Latin and Greek pronunciation, and what's the issue about Latin to do with what we would call church Latin versus 
possible lot. And what, what was the issue about lot pronunciation that he was uh, referring to? Well, um, you well spotted. <laughs> 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 uh, um, uh, it is um, it's noticeable on the decree, uh, and it crops up here and there elsewhere. Um, the I think that um, part of Gardner's uh, reasoning in opposing what was going on. Um, which he only did when it became sort of public. Um, but part of reasoning must have been, you know, okay, why it's just read, then what's next? Um, <laughs> next, they'll be telling us how to pronounce Latin according to the way that the Romans did. Um, and um, whereas Greek, uh, <clears throat> um, well, the Greeks thought that Greek was still a living language. Um, but uh, <laughs> Smith could make a good case for it being for them, for Westerners, essentially uh, a closed, uh, <coughs> finished uh, historical language uh, that was no longer uh, in use. Um, there was no question about that Latin was still in use. Um, there are lots of anecdotes about how the way that Latin was pronounced in England was different from the way it was pronounced in France or in Germany and so on. And this created problems, um, uh, but I haven't um, I haven't read sort of uh, detailed discussions uh, about this. I think in this context, it was a sort of fear that uh, the next thing uh, <coughs> that these um, right hand parts would come up with would be uh, why don't we all change the way we pronounce Latin? Um, and there's no doubt that uh, that is considered. Uh, Living language in the 1540s and the way beyond the um, uh, major, um, you're still being taught how to speak. Uh, and the point is quite often made uh, most of us read Greek, um, most of us learn Greek in order to read it, not in order to speak it. Um, it's made by Gardner, it's conceded uh, by Smith. Uh, uh, this was just not the case for Latin. Um, so I think it was kind of putting hands forward you know, just to, you know, <laughs> stake out the territory. Yeah. Yeah. I know in 1580s when Giordano Bruno was lecturing in Oxford, he was made fun of because he had the soft C. So by then, clearly, they had adopted a, a, a hard C and a more classical pronunciation as the norm in England. So it must have still been kind of a, going along as a reform. I, I I uh, wondered if you had any ideas about the date of publication of, of Smith's thing, why that might have been significant, it's 26 years. Was there something going on at the time, do, do you know? I'm, uh, I'm really just flagging this question because it will seem to just gloss over it and mm. it isn't actually normal uh, to uh, publish, well, yeah, I've known it's on. Um, <laughs> but generally speaking, uh, you don't wait 26 years to publish something. Um, uh, especially uh, if it is far from obvious why you should want to publish it at that point. Because it's not just the delay, it's why then? Why in, in 1568? Um, the previous year, um, one of the um, Paris professors uh, of Greek, Denis Lambert, had given a speech um, in which uh, he um, set out how Greek should be pronounced. Um, there's very little polemic. He just starts on the positive side. Um, I'm assuming you're a class of complete beginners. Here is how you pronounce Greek. Uh, and she gives them the reformed pronunciation. Um, uh, and then at the end she says, well, uh, there are some um, people who object to this, which uh, they've got no good reason to do. But in the preface, um, dedicating the work, the, the speech, um, publication of the speech, to uh, the son of Cardinal Turlon. Um, he is more cautious and says, um, uh, this is, of course, um, how Greek was pronounced. I'm not saying that you need to pronounce it like that, uh, but I do think you should know about it. Um, obviously, being aware that uh, the young um, Turlon's teacher might uh, not necessarily uh, pronounce Um, uh, but the priority is very
very tight. I initially thought perhaps Smith had uh, um, maybe even heard the lecture, but he wasn't in Paris at the time. Um, uh, could he have got wind of it or had uh, um, from his um, his diaries, his occurrences, it's very clear that because if you're a ambassador, you're with the court and the court is hardly ever in Paris. Um, so you're not necessarily at all in the swim from that point of view. But it could be that through some personal connection he knew of that. And um, Dumbranus does refer to, and indeed loves to paraphrase, the passages of Dionysus of Halicarnassus um, that, uh, um, that uh, Smith uh, had put, but we don't know when, uh, into his Treatise. Um, Sorry, was there a question? Well, sort, uh, sort of uh, uh, related to that, I thought it was um, um, perhaps this complicated, but to come back to that, but uh, I thought it was really interesting uh, how you analyzed the language of, of Gardner's letter as being uh, very uh, carefully chosen. Uh, uh, both archaic legal language, but also an archaic legal language which you wouldn't expect to find in a contemporary English uh, decree, which would have, uh, if in, in English, would have uh, sounded quite different. He was, of course, perhaps trying to um, assert his authority for a very specific audience. And so he may have chosen that language in order to, to be more, to carry more authority uh, to. Uh, Within a specific academic uh, market, who would respect, he would place himself in a, in a, in a, in a linguistic context, which they would respect, sure that he could, he could outdo them in that if it came to it. And does that perhaps tell also relate to why uh, Smith might, so that use of the text might relate to why Smith published in 1568? And he was, after all, uh, basically positioning himself in France, uh, being an English ambassador. And uh, it was useful for him uh, to place himself in um, a continental recognized intellectual environment, publishing on the struggling London printer. It was something he would actually quit Greek, so he would fly Greek. Uh, and he would get, he would get um, not only academic, but also a, a certain amount of, of standing in, uh, in an intellectual political discourse. And, well, I mean, that's just what I hope that by, as it were, um, uh, highlighting the question, that people would know more about what Smith was up to uh, politically and so on, might be able to, to uh, um, find more reasons. As far as I could see, I mean, it, it didn't, I couldn't see any obvious reason why it would help him at that point. Um, there are various possibilities as to why it might help Cheek, John Cheek, to publish his um, <coughs> uh, swap of, of letters with Gardner in 1555. Um, uh, difficult, um, <coughs> uh, really. I mean, um, it was earlier in 1555 that Gardner had had five people burned, um, and um, <coughs> uh, so. And then, of course, later um, in that year, um, uh, Chief himself was sort of kidnapped and, and brought back to England and put in the tower. Um, uh, it's not uh, it's not clear to me there either. Uh, it could have been uh, <coughs> working both ways. It might have been an attempt to save him, or it might have been uh, something that was would help him establish him as an exile before realizing that, before knowing that. <laughs> He was at Twingham. Um, yeah, in any case, um, Gardiner died in uh, October of the uh, early November of that year, so it's complicated. But as well as the language of the edict, um, I do think that it was meant uh, in part to be fun um, and that people would see it as that. Because to use that language, in order to discuss how to pronounce P or P or T, um, is just, um, it's not serious in the real world. And there are, um, uh, I mean, this paper got out of hand, but there was a section about, um, there's much more humor 
in this whole uh, <coughs> altercation. Um, but then I think people have made an answer. And a lot of the humour is in the style and in the way that uh, <coughs> Thomas Smith himself more than once says, um, uh, we understand that you are playing with us. Um, that this is a game that we're playing uh, of discussing uh, <coughs> these issues. Um, I don't think, um, uh, I mean, the, the prohibition, uh, I think, was real, um, because Aston once referred to it. Um, I'm not 100% certain um, that um, Gardiner actually <coughs> wrote that decree like that. Um, because our first text is 1555 printed with cheek stuff um, and it was certainly not beyond either cheek or Valentinus uh, Courier who published it to um, <coughs> do the decree <coughs> it's quite his decree <coughs> so we know um, uh, but um, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a long shot um, it's more likely I think that Barton did write it um, uh, but was at least in part tongue in cheek. Not as regards the discipline, because obviously there'd been a hubbub, um, and he didn't want, uh, uh, she was concerned that, that there should be, uh, up and, I mean, hierarchies should be respected, um, and that it was his business as Chancellor, if there'd been complaints, no matter who they'd been from. And he may indeed have been rather stubborn and, and having sort of, um, uh, <coughs> uh, sort of intervened to have been trapped. But he didn't actually. Um, he writes about a year later uh, saying, <coughs> did you tell me that Edith didn't have been followed quite um, as <laughs> well as one would wish? Please, will you do something about his record to his uh, vice chancellor? Um, I, I must remind you that uh, you know, this is quite serious, um, but you never hear of anybody uh, mm. um, suffering for it. I'm aware we're sort of short yeah, time, but I wanted to uh, just direct a couple of questions to Richard. Um, uh, are you implying, or is the implication that somehow his interest in architecture was almost sparked by? Reading Roman law. I mean, was he always interested in, in that? It comes quite early in his career, and he starts doing this, and you get the idea. So he was already kind of keen on these ideas. And I also wanted to ask these funny annotations, the icons. Does he use them in his other books, or is this something that he specifically does with the digest? And and thirdly, um, is this is, does he have an interest in memory systems? Sorry, yeah. can answer any of those. Thank you. He doesn't. Um, he does sketches. He does sketches amongst his notes in all sorts of books. Um, but he doesn't use this particular icon type, mm -hmm. which, which recurs in even with the slight variation. Well, fantastic one of flames shooting out of the house as well, um, when it's talking about problems with fire regularly. Um, so, so, no, these icons are quite specific to the digest, but I think there is a, a recognised problem which, which, which the commentators have talked about on how on earth do you get your head around this ghastly mass of stuff which is being organised for the one sort of principle. Which you also need to, to, to analyze and talk to other principles. So I think you know, principally a characterizing um, um, method. But I, I, I simply wonder whether there is also a demonic uh, memory system. In, in his massive book list, did he yeah. have books on, on the no, art of memory? No, no, nothing yeah. specifically on, no, nothing specifically on memory. Okay. On, on your first question about. Um, um, interesting building. I think this is, the, this is the earliest material which I know where he engaged in the issue of building. Um, and I think we know much earlier scholars, um, that I've gone the Pritnall, who used the digest in order to understand in particular the Roman house. So uh, there's a tradition of this building which, which um, 
which I think is extremely interesting and informative because it actually gives certain emphasis to certain characteristics of that absence. So it's these are really, really important because these important and authoritative lawyers have told us that they are. So, so there's a whole sort of mass of things being given validity value um, together. I think also, and perhaps I could connect with that to Colossus discussion. I think one of the things that's very interesting about the, about the pronunciation letter is it's slightly more of a discussion of how one recovers the, the past, how one recovers certain knowledge of the past. And in a sense, what we're seeing in the normal books is here is really authoritative text, which gives us a whole lot of detail, even if it's in a thoroughly indigestible form. So reading the building regulations, God, dreary thing to do. But it actually gives us all this data, which is really informative and authoritative. And in the pronunciation, one of the real problems that I run through is how can we be sure, after what is more evanescent than the sound of spoken words? And this is where the values is so fantastic, because it actually tells you as a lot of explaining that where you put your lips, where you put your tongue, etc. So do you do you think, Carlos, that this is also interesting as an exploration of how we find out about the past and know about the past? And, and, and in a sense he's using a really extreme problem of recovery and good pronunciation. And might that be one of the reasons why it was also published late? Professor might need to teach about. 
Um, what I think I'm saying is that that provided him with a starting point for something that obviously became a major interest later in his life. But remember, I talked about one copy of the truth that people might know about. He, he actually visited in his library a um, nine edition of the truth. So this is not a trivial engagement, this is something he's really working on. So I'm thinking of this as a starting point. Um, introducing certain ideas that then he can see in the framework, which is why I talk about today, that this is something that, that even very grand lawyers were exploring. They were, they were talking about the nature of and there's a fantastic commentary in the day on, on the nature of non load bearing partition borders. But it's exactly not what you expect, the poshest professor of law um, of the time to be engaged. So I, I'm with what I'm exploring is where the sort of the sort of conceptual intellectual substructure of what makes these things something that a really grand person can engage with uh, and, and sort of work on.